Hi everyone, welcome to lecture six of conservation biology. Um, Dr. Jess Drafford, Wilkes University. Today we're gonna to talk about ecosystem services. What are ecosystem services? Essentially it's any organism out there is gonna perform some function. And what we're gonna do is just highlight some of those functions that disproportionately affect biological communities and those that affect humans as well. Okay. The first one to go over is uh, soil formation and nutrient cycling. Of course, soil formation is important for uh, us to maintain healthy forests and also for uh, healthy agricultural systems. There are two very important uh, organisms, fungi and bacteria. Fungi are important as decomposers, and most of the time that's other living things that die, fall to the ground. Fungi convert those things to much simpler elements. They'll convert it in a, into a mushroom themselves, but then the mushroom eventually decomposes and those nutrients be, go back to the soil. There are a few uh, plants that form very tight relationships with uh, fungi and those fungi provide so, uh, nutrients and sometimes water and in return the plant through photosynthesis will make carbohydrates and those will uh, go back to the roots and leak out for the fungus. Uh, orchids, most orchids in the soil actually form these tight relationships as well. It's not listed here but lichens which uh, are composed of algae and two fungal species are important in decomposition of rock material. So they help turn uh, solid rock into uh, soil as well by break, helping to break it down. Uh, bacteria, the most important function for the globe on a global scale is the nitrogen cycle and what they do in the nitrogen cycle. So you have nitrogen fixing bacteria and they turn atmospheric nitrogen, which is N2, into ammonia nitrates and nitrites. Uh, there is a small amount that is converted uh, of atmospheric nitrogen is converted into these elements, these molecules uh, during lightning storms, but not in the scale that is needed to maintain life as we know it because we need, organisms need nitrogen uh, to make proteins, but most of that um, nitrogen is unavailable that's around us. So atmospheric nitrogen, even though the atmosphere is 70% nitrogen, you cannot use that to make proteins. So plants have to absorb uh, nitrous oxides and uh, animals have to eat proteins to get their, their nitrogen, okay? So you have these nitrogen fixers um, that turn atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia nitrates and nitrites, and then you have nitrifying bacteria that turn those compounds into nitrous oxides. Those are picked up by plants, animals eat the plants, and both animals and plants um, die and that, that, that nitrogen is then returned back to bacteria or back in, and then the bacteria, some of the bacteria actually turn it back into uh, atmospheric nitrogen, but that is the nitrogen cycle. Um, and like I said, those nitrogen fixing bacteria make life as we, as we know it possible. So without them, uh, you wouldn't have nitrogen available for the rest of life. And uh, there's a number of free living nitrogen fixers. And then there's a number of uh, bacteria that form just like fungus, a tight relationship with plants. And in particular, um, the legumes, so the beans uh, will form these tight relationships with nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria. And they'll actually boost nitrogen content in the soil. Okay. Next ecosystem service is flood control and soil retention. And there's a number of uh, structures, uh, natural structures that help protect uh, humans from storms. 
uh, such as hurricanes and storm surge. These include dunes shown in the top, that's a New Jersey dune, uh, barrier islands. Uh, there's a few barrier islands off the coast of New Jersey and the east coast and then along the Gulf Coast. Mangroves are in the tropics and coastal wetlands. So when a hurricane, say a hurricane moves from the, uh, the ocean and hits land, um, if you ever watch a hurricane, they'll come in as a category two and as soon as they hit land, they start to slow down. And so just land itself will help uh, suck the energy out of a hurricane, but also the coastal wetlands play a big role because the uh, destruction of the wetlands and the movement of water and sand and soil that energy that goes into moving those things is energy that's not available to say blow down a house. So wetlands, coastal wetlands are hugely important for just being an energy sink and catching that energy from storms. We know when we look at the effect of wetlands and, and how much they benefit uh, humans, it's in the billions of dollars every year. Uh, and what you can do is you can look at uh, cities with a healthy dune bear island uh, system and those without and then look at the damage it, that's caused. Um, unfortunately there's a loss of um, these functions because of sea level rise. So if your barrier island is only a few feet uh, above uh, sea level uh, it's it's more vulnerable to sea level rise so that structure that is absorbing the storm is just less present when the sea level rises if we look at coastal wetlands along the gulf coast um, those are being lost to subsidence and ironically flood control so the mississippi is a great example of where we put up levees along the mississippi and we dump sediment out to deep ocean where historically what has happened is the river overflows and those sediments would uh, settle and uh, keep forming coastal wetland. When you take away that uh, the new sediment, what you get, what happens is you get subsidence, which if you took a glass of uh, dirt and water and you shook it up, subsidence would be that this subtle sinking of the of the soil, right? It just settles. Um, so you need that constant replenishment of sediment and the levee actually takes that away. So you're losing your coastal wetlands very rapidly. Uh, fortunately, um, Louisiana has recognized that that is an issue and they actually will have, uh, during floods, will pump water into wetlands to uh, help replenish the uh, sediment that's lost the subsidence. Okay, riparian forests in our area, say directly around the university, riparian forests are uh, hugely important for flood control. Riparian just means it's, it's habitat that's associated with uh, rivers. And when you have forests, um, they absorb some of the floodwaters and slow down uh, the flood stages. If you've heard of a flash flood, flash is the rapid rate of uh, flood level rise and flooded forests actually reduce that speed. Okay, so riparian forests are hugely important and we know um, that when you uh, create impervious, impervious surfaces such as uh, streets and parking lots, you increase flash. So when you take a watershed and you put more impervious surface, more of that water gets to uh, streams and rivers more quickly and so you get more flash flooding. Flash flooding uh, is, is bad for several reasons, one of which is the scouring effect. So when you put more energy, more water into a system, you're going to get increased scouring and scouring is the uh, removal of sediment from the bottom of a river. Okay, and that's something you would like to avoid 
uh, a lot of times because that sediment's going to end up someplace where you don't want it. So rivers are nice because they reduce scouring in uh, small streams and even rivers. All right, the next ecosystem function is seed dispersal and pollination. And both of those, you know, the movement of seeds is the movement of future adults and the move of pollen is the gametes. Both of those are important for gene flow and avoiding inbreeding depression. Okay, so you're outcrossing. Um, I put in here a caveat is sometimes you promote out, outbreeding depression. So inbreeding depression is when you breed with close relatives, right? So pollination is when you increase pollination rates, you're getting pollen from uh, outside sources. So you're not inbreeding. When you move a seed into uh, out of the area where it's your siblings and your parents, you're more likely to pollinate with somebody that's not a close relative. And most of the time that's good. There is something called outbreeding depression. And outbreeding depression happens when uh, seeds and pollen go too far. And um, let's say you are uh, locally adapted to a particular climate. Say you are high up on a mountain and you get pollinated by something lower in the valley, you may be locally adapted to the mountain and having those genes, introducing those genes uh, that are adapted to warmer weather and a longer growing season may actually hurt your offspring. And that's called outbreeding depression. So there's a balance between inbreeding depression and, and outbreeding depression. So you wanna not breed with close individuals, but you also don't wanna breed with individuals that are outside of your, um, so your adaptation range. Um, another reason why seed dispersal is important is that you are not uh, competing with your siblings and your parent. And uh, the Jansen-Connell model of seed dispersal predicts that you'll have the highest fitness when you are, um, a particular distance away from the parent because also what happens is if you think about an oak tree if all the acorns fall below it's going to be very easy for an organism to find all the acorns but if you start scattering the acorns and you can think about this for any species of of plant if you start dropping your seeds right underneath, it's very easy for a seed predator to find those things. But as you disperse the seeds, it gets harder and harder for an organism to find those seeds. And that also in, uh, includes disease. So if you have a pathogenic fungus that affects a plant, uh, having your seeds disperse away may actually protect those plants from being infected. Okay, so it's predation and disease. So there's a couple different ways that um, seeds get around. One does endozucori, and the other is ectozucori. Endozucori is when an organism eats a seed and either vomits it up or poops it out. And the center picture here is actually a coyote scat that's full of raspberry seeds. So although it's kind of gross, um, what you may find is this becomes the source of a new raspberry plant. Uh, Endozucori is particularly important um, in the tropics where most of the trees have fruits that are dispersed by all sorts of things, including bats, monkeys, and birds. Uh, Ectozucori, if you've walked around the woods, uh, you've probably, and especially in the fall, have come away with uh, plants that stick to uh, your clothes. That is ectozucori. So the plant is using you or your dog as a form of seed dispersal. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the burrs that stick to clothes, and particularly if you have a long-haired dog, they can be a nightmare. Um, locally, specially, species that um, use endozucori um, and are dispersed by animals are economically important things such as cherry and blueberry, but also includes things like sassafras, raspberries, magnolias, oaks, um, 
you probably know in beaches are and hickories are all dispersed by squirrels and the smaller seeded species will be dispersed by blue jays as pictured above on top. Pollination, just like seed dispersal, is uh, increases gene flow. And you should know what pollination actually is. So it's moving the male gametophyte, right, the little micro gametophyte, to the female gametophyte or the mega gametophyte. And there's actually a sperm cell in the pollen. And the female uh, mega gametophyte, which is in the flower, and may become a fruit, um, has an egg cell. And you need to bring that pollen to the egg cell. Um, so that's what I mean by fixed uh, female gametophyte is the, the female gametophyte generally is not uh, moved around. It's the pollen that moves around. Pollinators include things as uh, beetles, flies, bees, hummingbirds, uh, orioles, and bats in the New World. And uh, in Africa, you can also include things that are called some birds, which are like hummingbirds, uh, but not, are not related to them, but they act just like uh, hummingbirds. And what you'll find is that you'll have lots of tight symbioses where a plant is pollinated by one or just a few pollinators. And pollinators, likewise, will only visit one or a few related plants. Uh, if you compare that to seed dispersal, seed dispersal uh, actually has few specialists. And in fact, you want to avoid specialists because what you want to do is get your seeds out in as many different areas as possible. So if you're eaten by a bird, you might go farther than if you're eaten by a raccoon, but a raccoon will, will take you someplace as well. So there's few specialists because all the animals will help you. Pollination is different because you want your pollen from the male to go to the female of the same species. And you try and devise ways, such as having a specialized floral structure that uh, excludes all, all the organisms. And what you hope is a, a bee will, for example, will go from your plant to another plant of the same species because uh, without specialization, you can have your pollen go into a different plant, which probably doesn't help you at all, right? So there's a little bit of push, evolutionary push for pollination to be specialized. And for conservation, this, this is incredibly important because if you have a decline of a pollinator, it can affect the pollinated species. And if you have a decline in the, in the plant, you can have a decline in the, um, in the species that, that pollinates. Uh, seed dispersal is, since it doesn't have a tight relationship, you can actually lose seed dispersal agents and possibly have redundancy, okay? Not always true, but you're more likely to have redundancy in seed dispersal systems. Uh, next, ecosystem service is predation and pest control. Um, so these also contribute to nutrient cycles and the transport of nutrients. And I have here whale poo and guano. So whale poo uh, is incredibly important for redistributing um, nutrients from one high nutrient place to a place that might be less dense. So uh, for example, baleen whales that filter feed will eat tons of krill, they'll swim along and poo it out to a place where it may not have the same amount of nutrients. And then you can get increased um, abundance of those organisms, photosynthetic organisms that are using that fertilizer essentially. And guano is bat and bird poop. And um, this is important for moving nutrients from, at least for seabirds from moving nutrients such as nitrogen from the ocean to the land. Uh, for bats, it would be moving it into a cave usually. And I'll just point out that the movement of guano or the production of guano on land from the ocean, that 
there were entire industries at one time just based on mining guano from um, old uh, seabird colonies, particularly in the American tropics. And there were whole industries based on just taking that guano and taking it up to uh, Europe. Okay, so you wonder why are so many British islands found in Latin America? It's because the guano industry uh, was so lucrative at the time. All right, and then you also have consumption of insect pests by birds and insects and by birds. We know that uh, when birds are eating a caterpillar that was eating a tree, uh, experimentally we've shown that by uh, excluding birds, the trees go more slowly. And if you are interested in, so if you are um, have a plot of land and you would like to sell the timber off there at some point, that you'll have to wait that much longer if you exclude birds that the bird population goes down for whatever reason. And the way they do this is uh, they net trees off and then they look at the insects and they also monitor the tree growth. And there's been some great recent work looking at crop yield and where birds are present because they're eating uh, pests, they actually increase the yield in coffee and grapes. So if you think about a coffee plant that may have uh, small insects eating the leaves, which are reducing the photosynthetic capacity, or you have um, sap sucking insects that are taking the photosynthates and, and siphoning them off to insects that they're producing less coffee. And by having birds remove those insects, you produce more coffee. And they've shown that birds increase crop yields um, by something like 10%, 5-10% uh, per acre. So if you multiply that out, across the coffee industry, it's millions and millions of dollars that birds impact the industry. So think about that next time you have your cup of coffee. Thank a, uh, a warbler that left your house earlier in the morning and flew down to South America for the winter for eating some, some bug that would eat coffee leaves. And then you have consumption of insects by other insects. And we know that um, this affects crop yields. Okay, so there's things like ladybird larvae uh, and, and small wasps that are predators on aphids and caterpillars. And you can actually buy these and release these in the field. And um, I have here ISWs is my nickname for impossibly small wasps. These are wasps that are under two millimeters long. They're incredibly important in ecosystems and in agriculture and have become a part of integrated pest management. So it helps you uh, eliminate or reduce the amount of synthetic chemicals that are used in your fields. And this middle picture is an experiment by a Wilkes alum that's currently at Texas A&M doing her PhD. And she's looking at if, uh, if plants send out chemical uh, signals to these predatory wasps, these parasitic wasps, and basically call the wasps to it if they're under attack. And the top picture is a cicada hunter that uh, successfully found a cicada. And cicadas as adults don't feed much, but the young will um, feed on roots under the ground. Uh, predation by vertebrates on other vertebrates. Uh, you have, there's a possible reduction in disease. The scales at which this works is much different than say a bird on a single tree, right? If you have a hawk, they have uh, a very broad territory. So determining its effect on uh, squirrel populations is going to be tough. Uh, to actually show experimentally. So this work is is still uh, not as well known as working with smaller organisms that you can pull into a greenhouse. But there's a possible reduction of disease. So white-footed mice are one of the key players in the amplification of Lyme disease in a community because if uh, white-footed mice gets Lyme disease and other ticks 
uh, bite that squirrel, they pass Lyme disease. So they become a, a basically an individual that radiates out um, Lyme disease by small ticks feeding on it. Um, so if you remove that mouse, you are going to reduce the incidence of uh, Lyme disease. So this right now is pretty much theoretical, makes sense to me, but you, uh, we need some experiments to show this is actually that uh, things like red tail hawks and, and snakes actually help control mouse populations. Uh, we do know that um, hawks and birds of prey, other birds of prey may help oak regeneration it sounds weird, but what you have are squirrels taking acorn and they disperse out the seeds and throughout the winter, they'll dig up those acorns and eat them so it no longer can become an oak tree. Um, but if you remove the squirrel, whose location of the oaks, the acorns are in that squirrel's brain, if you remove that squirrel from the population, those acorns have a much better chance of germinating and uh, becoming an oak tree. And we know that um, even the presence of predators can affect oak dispersal and oak regeneration. And there's uh, great work in this field that's now called the uh, landscape of fear. So how do things like squirrels and mice and other organisms that disperse seeds, how are they affected by the risk of predation and actual predation? The next ecosystem service is scavenging. Uh, it's important for nitrogen uh, cycling, of course. Uh, just like a tree that falls down and dies and becomes back, goes back to the soil through the action of uh, bacteria and fungus, you have scavengers uh, that will return a dead cow, dead deer back to the soil by uh, turning it into smaller chunks. So the vulture eats the deer and excretes out uric acid, the nitrogen and feces, uh, the carbon. So it's, they're very important in nutrient cycling as well. Uh, there, these scavengers are also probably very important for uh, human health in that black vultures consume dog poop and organic waste in tropical cities. So in many places in the tropics, you'll see uh, black vultures perusing the streets looking for uh, organic waste. By organic waste, I mean like um, half-eaten pizza that's, that's left on the sidewalk. These organisms will come along and remove, remove those um, waste products. And there was a great study that showed um, with the decline of vultures that rabies increased because you had um, dogs eating waste, uh, feral dogs, wild dogs that are unvaccinated. When you remove the vultures, the feral dog population went up because vultures were eating the food before the dogs. And when you remove the vultures, that there's that much more food for these feral dogs. So the feral dog population went up and then the incidence of rabies went up in these communities. Why did the vultures go away? Because there's an, anti there's an antibiotic that was given to cows and that antibiotic, although it's good for cows, uh, is very bad for vultures, causes um, kidney malfunction and the, the vultures die pretty quickly. Fortunately, that um, antibiotic has now been uh, discontinued and banned in India. Uh, there are some downsides to what we call mobile linkers. So these are mobile linkers are things like seed dispersal pollination and the movement of nutrients. So birds, for example, can move invasive plants, plants that are not just a, a problem to animals, but a problem to humans. And um, one example is honeysuckle. So that's a invasive species. Well, there's a number of species. There's a few invasive species. Uh, birds move those quite readily. And where we have more honeysuckle, it ends up that you have more uh, tick. I'm not sure what the uh, causation is there, but where there is more honeysuckle cover, there is more 
Lyme disease. And buckthorn, uh, which is pictured here, produces a fruit that um, is very attractive to birds. So it's nice and pretty. If you look at it, it almost looks like a blueberry. Birds eat it and it ends up having very little nutrients and also causes them to defecate quickly. So it's uh, essentially gives them diarrhea. And if you can imagine if you're a bird and you're consuming fruits before migration, you need things that are gonna be uh, providing some carbohydrates and lipids and these do not do that. The other downside to moving nutrients is that it can, in, it can include things like disease. So uh, a study came out that looked at uh, the ability of crows and ravens to break down the prions that cause chronic wasting disease and it ends up that it doesn't break it down, it just passes through. So if you have a deer that dies from chronic wasting disease, uh, that crow could eat some of the flesh, become infected, fly off and actually move the prions from one site to another. So this is the downside. So it's important to understand the positives and the potential negatives. There are of course medicines. Um, so this is directly important to humans, although there are some animals that will exploit medicinal properties of plants. Uh, we know that other primates do this, and we know that um, some birds and some other mammals will seek out plants with medicinal properties. Uh, the question is why do plants produce these things? Uh, realize that um, Fungi and plants are under constant attack from herbivores such as insects, mammals, right? So deer want to eat leaves, insects, caterpillars want to eat leaves. Uh, fungi attack plants, bacteria attack fungi. So uh, in order to fight this predation, organisms produce lots of secondary metabolites that can be, uh, have medical properties. So, um, and this is a good thing. I mean, this is why the world is green, right? So the reason why grass grows and trees are green is that uh, somehow herbivores are kept under check. And uh, in plants I have here, um, alkaloids are a common anti-herbivore chemical that's produced. And uh, most of our spices are actually secondary plant compounds that uh, are important for either fighting off fungus or fighting off uh, uh, herbivores. And we know there are some poisons and some venoms, uh, venoms that have uh, important properties that we use. So uh, rattlesnake venom, and then there's some invertebrate venom that's also used. Um, What's the difference between a venom and a poison? So a poison has to be consumed and a venom is injected. So you're injected with venom from bees and snakes, but uh, it's called poison dart frog because the dart, the dart frog does not inject you with venom. You have to eat the frog to, to get the poison. Uh, but all those things are have interesting properties to them. Bioprospecting is when you go in the field and you look for useful compounds and plants. And I just want to bring up the, the fact that um, there's been a, a history of abuse by pharmaceutical companies and going to the tropics and uh, not including the local communities uh, in their findings and returning some of the profits back to those communities to protect either the community or the forest where the, the plants have come from. And I know about this because uh, as somebody that likes to work in the tropics, even though I work with birds, which have nothing to do with pharmaceuticals, the sort of resentment feelings that come from some of these countries spills over, it affects all of us, even just people just visiting the country, but in particular scientists that go there to, to study because they love the organisms that are there. There are some health benefits to biodiversity outside of like just producing medicines. Uh, walking through the forest, you have 
a, a psychological benefit. You just have a, a better sense of well-being. This has been well studied. Um, you can lower your stress, heart rate. Um, there's a physiological effect that probably cascades down from the psychological effect. We know that in wards and halls that uh, where you're able to see nature, you can actually uh, heal more quickly. And then some plants actually improve air quality. Okay, there are some like conifers that make air quality worse in cities, but there are some plants that are important for improving work air quality. Uh, there's an economic benefit to biodiversity and um, homes with larger trees. So large old trees uh, are worth more. They add value to the property and uh, you can actually insure the trees on your property because they can be so valuable in adding a certain look to a property. And the first thing that people do is after they build a house is start planting trees and shrubs around the house. There's just a, a, a visual sort of almost innate like of, um, of plants around our house. And we know that when you have a more diversified landscape it actually increases value to the house. So a high diverse uh, house, uh, even unconsciously increases the value of the house. And this exploits something called biophilia, which, which is a word that uh, E.O. Wilson came up with is that we have this innate love of nature and like nature to be around us. It doesn't mean you're necessarily like insects and, and fungi, but it means you do enjoy green open spaces and green open spaces has become a key aspect of um, urban planning. There are also cultural benefits to uh, organisms. So whether this is an ecosystem service, uh, it's hard to say. I think it is, should be included. Um, so cultural benefits are those things that um, contribute to our culture. And so that the best example would be the bald eagles, the symbol of the United States. It's on our money. Uh, we enjoy seeing bald eagles. They're at sports games. They're always interesting to see. Uh, roses, you give flowers to uh, people you love, people you're thankful to, uh, poinsettias in the holidays. Um, I have here a stag that just came to mind as an animal that has uh, particular significance uh, in European cultures. Uh, the oak, if you're pagan, oaks are, are incredibly important. Uh, lots of team mascots are, are uh, in fact, the majority of uh, teams are probably named after animals. Right, Seattle Seahawks, the Cardinals, the Baltimore Orioles, right? So lots of animals play uh, a key role in our, our culture, even popular culture. And um, this is the symbol for medicine, right? So that's bird wings and two snakes. So that's ecosystem services. Of course, I'm only highlighting what I consider to be the key ones. There's many more functions that animals have out there and you can just pick any animal. It's serving some function. It may not be directly important to humans, but it's playing a role out there in the ecosystem.